Amen. From the 40th chapter of Isaiah. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and strengthens the powerless. Even youths will faint and be weary, and the young will fall exhausted. But those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. And may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. So having just returned from Ireland, although not Ireland's jet lag yet, uh, I must confess that my head is full of Ireland and my, and my inner cup is overflowing still quite a bit. Um, so I hope you'll forgive me if that cup overflows to you a bit this morning. Um, perhaps we can all experience our own mini Ireland retreat <laughs> together. Um, but I'm also cognizant of the fact that um, it re-entered the country um, with uh, some difficulties. Um, the flooding, especially in Houston, I'm reminded of, where about 50 people have died and tens of thousands have been displaced. But also the flooding in Mumbai, India, that has displaced hundreds of thousands and over 1,200 have lost their lives. Um, surely um, a lot of pain going around right now. Uh, and yet I find myself uh, you know, interpreting the, the flood now through Ireland and Ireland through the flooding. Um, and what I find is there's actually a, a curious convergence that takes place between both of these seemingly disparate themes. You see, one of the things that's been noted about Irish poetry and thereby the Irish psyche uh, for some time is that it could really be captured in uh, one particular theme that keeps reiterating itself. That theme is that which still stands when everything else has been stripped away from you. That which still stands when everything else has been stripped away from you. Surely a lot of flood victims are experiencing that very dynamic, all things being uh, stripped away. Um, and perhaps they will come up with some of the conclusions about what's left standing that the Irish did over, over centuries of struggling with this very topic. Now, I, I should note that this topic seems kind of dark. I mean, would you ever want to be Irish if that's your, your constant theme? <laughs> and yet, um, you bear in mind, we tend to think about everything being stripped away, about like all the good things being stripped away, but that which remains. But when everything's stripped away, that also means the bad things being stripped away. So there is this uh, particular interplay between darkness and light uh, in the Irish psyche and, so, and struggle and also um, beauty and blessing at the same time. Perhaps we could find a little bit of that beauty and blessing uh, this, this morning. I uh, am thinking particularly in Irish history of uh, uh, St. Uh, Patrick, the uh, patron saint of Ireland, uh, he was absolutely no stranger to losing everything he held uh, dear, starting at age 16. And he, Patrick was not a native of Ireland, actually. He was a native, uh, we think, of Great Britain, somewhere in the West. And uh, as he relates in his book of confessions later as an adult, um, when he was 16, he was out playing someplace um, away from his house, and pirates came, and they captured him, and they bound him and put him on a ship for Ireland where they sold him as a slave to a local chieftain. Kind of a polite way of saying warlord. Uh, and that chieftain then uh, put him in charge of tending uh, his, uh, his flocks of sheep. 
Now, Patrick then, um, you know, it was given very uh, scanty provisions, including clothing. So at times he even had so little clothes that he would go naked out there tending the sheep. And so he, 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 he suffered the particular despair of someone who has lost family, has lost all their friends, has lost their faith community, has lost their homeland, and has lost even their dignity, and now spends half their time half frozen and wet. I mean, there's a reason why Ireland's green. Um, and so Patrick really did have just everything stripped away from him at age 16. And yet he would later write as an adult, look back to this time, and give thanks to God for it. Count this time as a slave, as a blessing. You know, that just makes me wince <laughs> inside, just to even think about that. But it has to do with something that Patrick received, that which was left standing, uh, that Patrick discovered that he felt was more valuable even than life itself. What was that? Something? Well, it's better to experience it rather than talk about it. And I think we can actually get a hint or a suggestion of what Patrick experienced back in the the. the fifth century, um, if we think about uh, one of those 16-year-old or teenage flood victims, either in Houston or Mumbai, where probably many of those 16-year-olds have lost everything, including uh, family. But if you can picture a 16-year-old boy or girl in one of these locations and, and, and call them into not just your mind, but your heart, such that you begin to empathize with this person. If you can call them into your heart deeply enough that their pain sinks, sinks into you as if it is your own pain, your own struggle with uncertainty, your own loneliness. If you can hold that person and their pain in your heart enough that it begins to move you to want to embrace this child uh, and, and comfort this child as if this child were your own. And if, if in that embrace you can come to the, the sensibility that God, if you could just do anything for this child to move him or her out of their, their struggles and onto firmer land, that you would just move whatever mountains you could to do that. If you could feel all those things then you know something of Patrick's experience uh, as a slave when all had fell away. Patrick experienced these feelings, not necessarily for another person, but he experienced them coming toward him from God. He felt this presence that he never had really related to before. In fact, he writes that even though his father was a deacon in his church, and his, his, his grandfather served as a priest. He had never taken his faith seriously at all. I mean, can you imagine that, a, a youth not taking their faith seriously? That was Patrick. But when all else had been stripped away, he discovered a presence, a, a sense that there was an awareness of his pain and struggle, that there was a loving awareness such that it wanted to reach out and embrace him as if he was that presence's son. And such that this presence loved, and not just loved him, but wanted to do whatever was in this presence's power without breaking free will to move this person from slavery into freedom. And it just, it set him on his knees. He, he experienced this not as just simply powerful, wishful thinking, but as rock-solid reality, uh, and continuing experience. And it continued so steadily in him as he was out there half frozen, half naked, that uh, he became more and more confident that this vision of actually being moved from slavery to freedom was true, that he would eventually be freed. And that freed him then to concentrate on those blessings just that every one of us find in our everyday lives, those smaller quote-unquote, smaller blessings, like breathing, <laughs> like having enough food on your table to sustain you for the day, or the beauty of his surroundings. I mean, he was surrounded. He was in Ireland. 
the beauty of the grass and the, the mountains and the other flora and fauna around him, including those sheep that he was uh, tending to, uh, noticing these blessings, giving thanks for them throughout the day. And as time went on, then God became as much of a presence for him as his own breathing. Eventually, Patrick was uh, freed. And, uh, actually, he wasn't freed. He had a vision. He had a vision and a dream that said, your ship has arrived, go. And that emboldened him to escape. And he walked 200 miles to the coast where he just happened to find a ship that was leaving for England the next day. He asked the captain if he could come aboard. The captain said no, but changed his mind and brought him on board. And he eventually made it back uh, to not only his homeland, but his family. Well, Patrick, at this point, was so anchored in, you know, the this faith that, that had come to him when all else was stripped away, that he wanted nothing better than to serve this faith as a priest. So he entered seminary, became a priest. And, uh, you know, if at this point, you know, it would have been quite possible for Patrick's story to simply be lost to us in the, uh, in the mists of history. He could have been one of those priests who goes off and serves some nameless, now nameless parish in some now forgotten town, and we would have never heard of him. But that's not Patrick's story. Now, several years into his priesthood, uh, Patrick once again had a vision and a dream. It was of an Irishman uh, carrying all kinds of letters from the Irish people to him saying, please bring your faith over to Ireland. Now, that kind of vision would have seemed quite outrageous to people of the church in their day. They had basically written off the Irish as too barbaric and too dumb <laughs> to be evangelized. They considered them the lowest of the low on the earth. Nobody went to evangelize uh, the Irish. The only Christians they were there, actually, the church is sent over to make sure that the Christians didn't turn into pagans. <laughs> and, and so that was it. But Patrick, and of course, Patrick had been enslaved by the Irish. He had every reason never to return, to only ever hold on to you know, a, a thirst maybe for vengeance, if anything else. And yet, uh, Patrick went to, back. And he shared this faith that had been standing when all was stripped away to even the people who had enslaved him. And you know, given that that's part of Ireland's whole psyche, you know, lots of things stripped away, that message rang true to the local population. And so tons of people started getting attracted to not only Patrick, but then also to Patrick's disciples. In fact, Christianity spread um, in such a way that um, it's the only um, actually country that went entirely Christian without ever, ever there being any violence or threat of violence or, or po native populations being pushed out and then becoming Christian. It was the population, the native population, who welcomed uh, this message and also the deep respect that Patrick had for these people who, who knew that, that these people, though they were, did not share his same faith originally, still shared something of God within them. And his message then resonated God person to God person, and it bloomed. So Patrick now... <laughs> patron saint of Ireland, and patron saint that looks after that, that experience that is so Irish, that when all else is stripped away, there is one thing that can remain to you, even if you don't even know it's within you, even if you've never taken your faith seriously, when all else is stripped away, there is something that remains, and that something is worth giving your life to.
from 2 Corinthians. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be visible in our bodies. So after the, uh, where, where, where are we here? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> there we are. There's my friend, uh, Eric Still. He, I met him in junior high uh, and his wife, Jules. Uh, they were on the Ireland retreat with me. And, and after the formal retreat was over, uh, uh, the two of them and myself, we traveled around the south of Ireland so I could uh, uh, kind of explore some Celtic sites that I hadn't uh, been to before. And one of them was an ancient 6th century monastery called Clon McNoys. Now, Clon McNoys uh, started out in the 6th century with just 10 people. And once again, uh, that, that magic of that faith, that buoyant faith that, 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 could tr that trusted that God was in all people and that, that, that if... Through, especially through then the, the lens that they had of Christianity, that that, that, that God was a beneficial power, that, that God uh, loved you beyond all reckoning, that it resonated so much that people began to flock to Clon McNoise, and, and it grew into a community of about 1,500 to 2,000 people. Now, Clon McNoise is not the most beautiful of all the sites. It's, it's, it's in ruins. Um, uh, but to me, it was one of the most moving uh, of all the sites um, because Clon McNoise, especially between the 8th and, and 12th centuries, um, over the course of 400 years, it was attacked or destroyed 80 times. That's one attack or destruction every five years for 400 years. Can you imagine on the 27th time you're attacked or destroyed saying, let's rebuild? <laughs> And yet, we know even in places that are ravaged regularly by hurricanes that not everyone disperses for, to live on high ground or in safe places. People tend to come back and rebuild, we, and we scratch our heads saying, why would you do that knowing that a hurricane is going to probably come in another few years you know, again? Well, in Clon McNoise, anyway, we have a suggestion of what happened, why they kept rebuilding. Uh, one was that strong faith they had that, again, that Patrick had found is there when all else is stripped away. And yet, faith alone would not explain why they kept rebuilding because they could have just simply taken themselves and their faith well away from the potential of harm. So why did they keep coming back staying there, rather, and rebuilding. Well, probably for similar reasons that many people who suffer hurricanes come back and rebuild there. It's not because they're crazy. It's because they found true and loving community there. This is where their friends are. This is where the people they love are. And it didn't make sense to these people. They, that, that love in community was evidently so strong in Clon McNoise uh, that it never made sense. It's destruction or attack after attack to simply disperse to the wind, you know, everybody going off to wherever they had family or jobs or what have you. No, um, they had an intuition that's probably quite similar to that of modern-day William Sloan Coffin, the former minister of, of Riverside Church in New York City, who said, you know, bottom line... It's better not to live than not to love. It's better not to live than not to love. Love is what we all live for. And if there is none of that, it's not worth living. Yeah. They had found this amazing love, this amazing connection. Love of God, to be sure, which then worked its way out in love of neighbor and love of neighbor's neighbor as well, building that incredibly strong community one might say that love rebuilt Clon McNoy's 80 times. It makes me wonder, 
what love could do for us today. Oh, and speaking about love, relationship in Ireland, here are a few scenes from this Ireland retreat. Third time's the charm. I expect you to do that on the way out, right? <laughs> it's a terrific poem that was found on a plaque in Ireland. It's called, We Saw a Vision. In the darkness of despair, we saw a vision. We lit a light of hope, and it was not extinguished. In the desert of discouragement, we saw a vision, and we planted a tree of valor, and it blossomed. In the winter of bondage, we saw a vision. We melted the snow of lethargy, and the river of resurrection flowed from it. We sent our vision a swim like a swan in the river. 
The vision became a reality. Winter became summer. Bondage became freedom. And this we left to you as our inheritance. O oh, generations of freedom, remember us, the generations of the vision. Probably the one site I will remember most from the Ireland retreat was actually one of the most ordinary sites you could imagine. It was parlor number four in the cathedral of Clonard in Belfast. It's just an ordinary church parlor. There's nothing special about it. You go inside and it's kind of small and that's about that. But something very extraordinary happened in this most ordinary of places. Many of you know that one of the, the primary reasons for going to the north of Ireland to begin with was to look at closely the peace and reconciliation process uh, that has taken place over years between Protestants and Catholics, especially since uh, the conflict spilled over into violence and outright terrorism starting in 19, the late 1960s and continuing for 30 years until uh, the late 1990s. Uh, we met up with poets, musicians, and activists, all of whom had been directly affected by what the Irish call the Troubles. One of them, in fact, uh, had uh, seen with her own eyes at age two the murder of her father right in front of her. And hearing about these, these struggles, which had, had happened for so long, um, it just amazed us all that that at one point, um, a group of Protestants and leaders and a group of Catholics leaders um, did the unthinkable. Uh, they met. They met secretly in this very room. And they met even though each one of these leaders personally knew people who had been murdered by the other side. Even though they knew that the other side had orchestrated some of these murders or at minimum applauded them. Each side had terrific blood on their hands and terrific reasons for jumping across the table and grabbing the throat of the, other, the person on the other side of that table. And yet, they met. They even had people in their own constituencies, had they known that meeting were taking place, would have done everything in their power to stop it. And yet, they met. Why did they meet? Because they're Irish. They knew that when all else is stripped away, and certainly for them, so very much had been stripped away, never to give up that there's always something left standing. And what was left standing for them was not a shared faith, Patrick found faith left standing, but between that group, there was not a shared faith. There was no shared sense of community. The people in Claw and McNoise had discovered community last, but amongst that group, there was no sense of shared community, no sense of loving relationship. In fact, the people who met in that place had the deep realization that their generation would probably never reconcile with each other. The wounds were just that deep. And yet, they met because when all else had been stripped away, they each had something in common that remained. And that thing that they held in common was the future. They had a past that was horrifying. They had a present that was horrifying. But they had a future that was still unknown and uncreated. And they had this deep intuition that while they and their generation could probably never reconcile adequately to stop the violence, they would do everything in their power to ensure that their children could reconcile. That their children could put differences aside and come together and experience the locomotion together in peace. 
And so that meeting led directly to well, another meeting and another and another. And those meetings built a bridge directly to Good Friday 1998 and the Good Friday Peace Accord that has held ever since. While violence has occasionally touched the Irish people since, it's nothing like it was before. And their children now can work on forging a relationship without the threat of ongoing violence. Now, there's something interesting about this room. You probably couldn't notice it uh, from this distance, but there's a painting up on the wall to the left. Let me bring that up a little bit closer. You still not be able to see it adequately. But to some of you, this painting may look familiar. And if it seems familiar to you, it's because you have seen the original of this painting in our own Jocelyn Art Museum. So we have a connection to this most ordinary and extraordinary room, even here in Omaha. But I'd venture to say we have a deep connection with this room, not only through this painting but through what we are doing here and what we have discovered here. Like the Apostle Paul, we have come to find that faith is an enduring blessing, an enduring resource. Like those in Clon McNoise, we have discovered also that community is worth investing in, that it is one of those blessings that is capable of truly enduring. And like those who sat in this room so many years ago, at great personal risk for themselves, we have discovered that a future for our children is worth risking it all for. We have discovered that hope is an enduring blessing. No, here in Omaha, we have discovered that faith, community, and hope are still resources which we can use to create a better future for our children and our children's future, and that we can even meet issues as difficult as they, and even perhaps more difficult, reconciliation between the three Abrahamic faiths is just a, a, bit, is a bit outrageous to a whole lot of people. And yet we also know that as we travel the country, we're not the only ones with faith, loving community, and hope that actually there are all kinds of resources of these very things all around the country. That despite the fact that we are meeting catastrophic uh, fires and catastrophic floods and catastrophic political polarization around our country, we still have more than enough resources of faith, loving community, and hope to guide our way into the future. The only question is will we take these resources and use them far and widely enough so that they're not all that remains in our future. The Irish knew about faith, loving community, and hope over centuries, but they were also... Uh, we know that centuries before them, the Apostle Paul knew that these three remain, faith, hope, love. And the greatest of these, Paul said, is love. After all, it was love that rebuilt Clon McNoise 80 times. And it is love that we can build a future on together. Love originally made known to us most fully in this very meal in which Jesus took bread and after giving thanks, he broke the bread, saying, My friends, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as often as you eat of it in remembrance of me. And so likewise, after supper, he took that cup, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. By eating this bread and drinking this cup, we remember Christ's death. We celebrate Christ's resurrection, and we know that truly love endures, has endured to this day, to the point where we take love to this day into our body and blood and do something for the world with it. These are the gifts of God.
for the people of God. I invite our servers to come forward to prepare this table. And as they do so, I invite you to join me in reminding ourselves of who we are and whose we are. We are an inclusive, open, and affirming family of faith, welcoming all to God's table of love and acceptance. We are diverse, yet united by Christ's example. We care for one another, support one another, and challenge one another to become all that God creates us to be. We work together to nurture our community and to promote peace and justice in our conflicted world. You do not have to be a member of Countryside Community Church or subscribe to any particular doctrine or dogma to come forward to this table. All that we ask is if your heart calls you forward, know that you are most welcome here. So likewise, if you prefer to receive communion from your seat, simply raise your hand as an usher passes and you'll be served there. Or if you'd prefer to abstain altogether, know that your presence here alone blesses us and blesses many. But if you do decide to take a piece of bread, come forward, take, we invite you to take a piece of bread, dip it into this cup. And know that whether you are a person of deep faith or you're a person who, like Patrick at age 16, had never taken this stuff particularly seriously, this bread and this love is for you. And it is given to you not only for yourself, but for the blessing of many. The gifts of God for the people of God. Let us join the feast.